Namaste. So, now that we've clarified <laughs> the ontological position of this teaching, the direct path, let's get down to Shiva's specific instructions. Beginning at verse 15, he says, Instead of following this direct path, do not ever contemplate even in the least upon chakras located in six adharas, centers in the body. Nadis, subtle nerves that produce the ten divine sounds, such as pranava. The deities associated with the lotus seats and the adhara chakras, beginning with Vinayaka, Ganesh. The mantrakshara's potent sound syllables for the worship of these deities, and the diverse mandala murtis, the god aspects, starting from those controlling the sun, surya mandala, the moon, chandra mandala, and fire, agni mandala. Verse 16. Those who seek everlasting liberation need not endeavor to practice repetition and countless verse mantras, repeating potent scriptural words or texts to gain various ends, and methods of yoga such as breath control, pranayama, breath retention, kumbhaka, and concentration, dharana. There is no room for performing puja, worship of deities, namaskaram, paying homage by prostration, japa, incantation, dhyana, contemplation, and so on. Hear from me that the highest truth acclaimed in the Vedas can be known only through jnana. Hence, there is absolutely no need to know anything outside of oneself. <laughs> I can hear the keyboards, uh, the comments, <laughs> the little pitter-patter of the of keys. Uh, that Dave, what's going on with this? Huh? I mean, all in the previous series, you were talking about doing these mantras and doing these uh, contemplations of chakras and so on and pujas. You did all the Mahalakshmi puja and this and that and the other thing. And now you're saying that these are all to be rejected? What's up with that? Okay, just slow down. <laughs> you remember our chart of the four levels, the four views, Chaturdarshanam. So this teaching, the direct path, is at the highest level of the vivartavada, the view that the world is simply an appearance. And upon completion of this particular teaching, then one is enlightened. It's in the ajatavada. So when one graduates from one level to another, uh, normally, he does not keep up the same methods. The methods change. That's why an instruction given at one level can be rescinded at another level or even opposed. What was recommended to the beginners is not a good practice for those who are advanced. This is as it should be, is it not? If the spiritual path is progressive, then when you reach higher levels, you don't keep up the same practices as before. You graduate. Huh? Because why? You got the result. When you get the result, you don't keep doing the same thing. That's only natural. So when we get the result of Dvaita Vada, which is punya, good fortune, good karma. We graduate to the Vishishta Dvaita Vada, and then we take up bhakti. 
Uh, bhakti was in development in Dvaitavada, but under the uh, impetus of rules and regulations. When bhakti comes into its own, then that's Vishishtadvaita. When bhakti becomes spontaneous, a natural expression of one's relationship with God. So it is not that one should be uh, attached to the means. The Buddha says this teaching, this Dhamma, is like a raft. Once you cross the river to the other side, you don't keep the raft with you. You don't carry it on your head. You don't drag it along wherever you go. You drop it. Let it go. So when a particular means or technique has given you its result, now that's it. You, you drop it. It becomes a part of you. It becomes internalized. So you don't anymore have to keep it up. So anyway, those who are practicing bhakti, when they reach realization of their swarup, uh, their permanent or eternal relationship with their ishta devata, the idealized form of God, which is unique for that individual, then they, they also drop that, see? And they go on to the vivartavada. In the vivartavada, there is no God. That's why Buddha's teaching is sometimes criticized as being atheistic or pure Advaita, as given by Shankara, Shankaracharya. It's sometimes criticized as being atheistic. It's not atheistic at all. It's simply indifferent towards the idea of God. It's indifferent towards all ideas and concepts. Why? Because if there is a God, then there must be an individual. See? Every, every pair of opposites, every dichotomy, every duality is a thing, one thing. So black and white, right and wrong, good and bad, God and the individual. See, these are dichotomies, dualities, Shiva and Shakti, See, these are all one thing. As Buddha says, the way he puts it, when this is, that is. When this arises, this comes to be. And when this ceases, this disappears. Why does he say this and this? Why doesn't he say this and that? Because they're not two separate things. For example, the cause of death in Buddha's teaching is birth. Birth and death are one thing. They appear to be two things because they have two names. But really they're one thing. They arise together and they disappear together. Upon birth ceasing, death also ceases. Another example is consciousness and name and form. As soon as you have consciousness, you have name and form. Consciousness has all kinds of objects, right? And then they have to be classified, and so terminology is necessary, and they have to be recognized, so we have to remember their form, their shape, and so on. Name and form. Name and form begets consciousness. Consciousness begets name and form. Uh, they're one thing. As soon as consciousness arises, so does name and form. As soon as consciousness passes away, so does name and form, or the other way around. That means they're one thing, not two. So in the same way, <laughs> when duality itself passes away, 
What's left is the truth. What's left is reality. See, this is the point. All these techniques of lower stages depend on duality, subject and object. I am the sadhu and I am doing this technique. I am trying to realize uh, the self. Uh, so that consciousness, that being of a sadhu, rests on and is dependent on the object or the particular technique. And when that technique is realized, that duality collapses. The technique becomes part of oneself. It's no longer separate. It's no longer an object. It's part of the subject. That technique is now successful, and you can move on to the next one. See, it's a gradual process of neti neti. Neti means not this, not this. See, it's, it's not, not this, not that. <laughs> because they aren't really two separate things. They're one, this. So, at this point, we are at the level where techniques themselves are discarded, are negated, are invalidated, and thrown away, let go. Huh? The raft itself has done its job. It has brought us to the other shore. Now it's time to let it go. So what does this mean? <laughs> Well, like we said last time, simply to recognize the truth the way it is, always has been, and always will be, is to realize the self. That only the self has ever existed. Actually, at this point, even the, the dichotomy of existence and non-existence is invalid. <laughs> Because what is existence? Existence means to have some essence or reality in itself, isn't it? But as we have seen, the world is simply an appearance. It doesn't have any existence. It doesn't have any reality in itself. So then non-existence also becomes meaningless. See? But if I'm in a movie theater watching a movie and I see something on the screen, let's say a car, is it meaningful to talk about the existence or non-existence of the car? No. Because the car neither exists nor not exists. It's just a projection on a screen. See, it's just a picture. So what we're talking about here is the end of all these dichotomies, the end of duality, the end of the subject-object split. And this is complete self-realization. So this is the very, very last technique or sadhana or understanding. After this, that's it. Because when all dualities are collapsed, then Awareness is unestablished. It doesn't have any base. Try to understand. As soon as awareness has a base, as soon as consciousness has an object, it's conditioned by that object. So as soon as I see the world in terms of any duality, right and wrong, good and bad, truth and untruth, existence and non-existence, etc., etc., etc. My consciousness is now conditioned by that, and I become subject to all kinds of nonsense like confirmation bias and, you know, all this. 
These are all symptoms of <laughs> delusion. <laughs> Look, it, you know, there was a movie a long time ago, Harvey. Harvey is the name of this nine foot tall rabbit. And there's this guy who goes everywhere and he, he sees this rabbit, right? Well, he's the only one who sees the rabbit. <laughs> So he's talking to his friend, Harvey. <laughs> hey, Harvey, what do you think about this? You know, so, of course, the movie takes place in New York. You know, where else? So now, if this happened in real life, it would be considered psychosis, right? The guy is hallucinating. He's making up this story. And there's absolutely no proof for it. So in the same way, <laughs> people in ordinary consciousness have made up or accepted this story that there is an objective universe, that physical things have reality, they have existence in themselves, huh? they have some essence, they have some being, and they persist. Huh? If I go to sleep and the whole world disappears and then I wake up in the morning and it comes back, the same objects are still there, right? <laughs> Philosophers know very well there is no way to prove this. Because any proof has to come, any evidence of the reality of the world has to come from the world. But to prove something, you need something else of similar stature to compare it with. For example, if I want to prove that uh, this laptop, I mean, this, this tablet weighs, you know, half a, ki a kilogram or whatever it is, I have to compare it with a standard. Somewhere there's a standard kilogram. So I have to compare this object with that and that's how I get the weight. So if I'm going to prove the existence of the world, that means there needs to be another world someplace to compare it to, to prove that it's real. But there ain't no such thing. <laughs> so philosophers have known for a long, long time, there is no possible proof of the reality of the world. And actually, our experience shows that the world is impermanent. It disappears every night when we go to sleep. So the existence of this world is a very debatable <laughs> subject. So actually, the world doesn't exist. <laughs> it was never born. It's just a projection, just an illusion, a vision a movie. That is very trivially provable by our own experience. So as soon as we get off this made up story and come to affirm our own experience, we're enlightened. That's what Shiva is saying here. There's no need for all these different techniques and all this stuff, you know. That's all external. That's all part of the illusion. Simply drop it and accept the reality. What you see with your own awareness, that's enlightenment. Oh, tut -tut. oh, oh, by the way, so there's no such thing as enlightenment and non enlightenment <laughs> either. Om Tat Sat. Om Harihi Om.